uh, image of the Messiah, something that the Jews had built up, and they had imagined him as they would imagine a secular Messiah, right? Now, you know that the Romans had oppressed the Jews at that time, and they had occupied the Jewish territories. And the way the Romans did things is they would go into your country, they'd conquer you, then they'd with, withhold taxes from you, you know, a lot of taxes, and that would fund the Roman army and the Roman government. And they, would, they wouldn't give any services back. They would just conquer and take. And so the Jews obviously were expecting a Messiah who would come and free them from this kind of oppression. Um, but then when we go back to the image of the birth of Christ, it's a completely different uh, image, and, and I guess we can talk about the icon. So in the image of the nativity, or the incarnation of Christ, there's several beautiful features of this icon. Uh, the first one is St. Mary's always dressed in blue, and the reason she's dressed in blue is because she's like heaven, right? And God lived inside her, and God lives in heaven, and we call her the second heaven. And sometimes you'll see her in a blue with stars all over her, right, as if she is heaven. And we also see that, that uh, J- Joseph, he's got his hand on his cheek. And the reason he has his hand on his cheek is because he sort of has no idea what's going on, right? So it's a look of bewilderment. He's kind of like just taking all this in. There's this woman. She just had a baby. She didn't conceive naturally. All of a sudden, angels are appearing. All of a sudden, these three wise men say, you know, we, we've come to worship this baby. And he's taking all this in, and he has no idea what's going on. And he's very, very confused, as you can imagine he would be. And also, in many icons, you find that Joseph isn't next to Mary, St. Mary and Christ, but he's way over in the corner, and he's small, right? And so often in these icons, they'll put Joseph off in a corner because really he has nothing to do with all of this, right? He's sort of just part of the scene, but not really part of it. And, and that's why in our church, you know, there's sometimes you'll see Christmas cards with like Joseph and he's got his arm around Mary and it's like, and then it's the holy family, but it's not really a family, right? It's more like Mary, you know, immaculately conceived Christ and Joseph is kind of this old guy who was assigned to take care of them and he has no idea what's, what's happening. Um, And you see all the magi, the three wise men offering gifts, and you see the angels, and you see the shepherds uh, in in the back. And then we have these two other icons next to it. One of them is the burning bush. And if you notice today, we sang a song during communion, the burning bush. And so the burning bush is always a symbol of the incarnation. As you can see, St. Mary is a symbol of the burning bush because the reason she's a symbol of... of, um, uh, of, uh, of the incarnation is that the burning bush is a story of Moses. The bush was on fire but did not get consumed. And we say this about St. Mary that she gave birth to Christ without losing her virginity. And also in the same sense, you can imagine in the Old Testament it said, if anyone saw God, he would surely die. Right? This was the Old Testament um, uh, you know, position. Right? And Mary carried God. So you can imagine the, the, the movement from if you see God, you'll die, to seeing, touching, carrying inside of her. And she wasn't consumed in, of, you know, in fire by, by, by having God inside her. So this burning bush, which was on fire but didn't get consumed, is a symbol of St. Mary. And less so, or less to our mind, is this, this story here. What's this icon here? This is Jacob's ladder. If you remember a long time ago in the Old Testament, Jacob had a dream. And he had a dream that there was a ladder connecting heaven and earth, and on this ladder came up and down went angels. And so we think of St. Mary as that connection between heaven and earth, right? She is that ladder that connected, if you will, God. He kind of came down the ladder to earth through her. So she was the ladder that brought him down. In fact, in some Greek Orthodox churches, in the in the niche of the church, you'll find that instead of an icon of Christ like we have, they'll have an icon of St. Mary. And the reason it's a very nice symbol is, um, you know, a building is four, has four corners. And we talk about it being square. Well, the four corners in the book of Revelation talks about the four corners of the earth. So the square building is always a symbol of earth. And the dome that's in some churches is always a symbol of heaven, of infinity, right? And, And a circle is always a symbol of infinity. It's a symbol of God. Uh, that's why we are wedding rings, right? For example, it's in, in weddings or marriages are forever. 
And so if you think about the church, it's a building, right, earth, and there's heaven, and it's where earth and heaven, heaven and earth come together, right? Christ is where heaven and earth came together. So the, the dome is heaven, the bottom is earth. Now if you think of the, the niche of the church, it connects the two, right? So the, the dome and the earth, and so they'll put St. Mary uh, sometimes in the niche just as a connection. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. Um, so anyway, so that's uh, the reason we have those icons in the church. And what we did is we just put an icon of the, the story of the birth of Christ and then two Old Testament symbols next to it that sort of you know, foreshadow um, uh, the birth of Christ. Um, but let's talk more about the, the birth of Christ uh, in the first place. Um, so, so what's the point of the birth of Christ? What, what is, what is, why is this important? Um, and Christ, in, in very many ways, he taught us several things about the kingdom of heaven. And so the birth of Christ was bringing heaven to us and was ta- teaching us about the kingdom. And the first thing he taught us is how to enter this kingdom. So this was one of the many missions of Christ's incarnation. Um, And he told us that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he said things like, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself shall be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So he started telling us about this kingdom, and then he started telling us this is how you enter the kingdom. Right? Do the will of God the Father, be like a little child. So he started to teach us about the kingdom. And he also described to us the kingdom. And how did he describe to us the kingdom? What was Christ's preferred method of describing the kingdom? Anyone know? Hmm? How did he often do it? Parables, right? He would tell parables, parables like a story. And he would say, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. A kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And notice, by the way, he's always talking about agriculture. Why is that? It was an agrarian society, right? Everywhere you looked around, it was agriculture, right? And so Christ, imagine Christ standing on the boat teaching He looked around, and everyone's a farmer. And so he wanted to take this concept of heaven and bring it down to the concept of the people. So he gave them analogies of of farms, the stuff they can understand, fields, sowing seeds, planting, weeds, thorns. Okay, And this brings us to something very important, which is God never stays above man, but rather in his humility try to bring everything down to him. Right? And we should take note of this sometimes in our own lives. Sometimes as a church, we can sometimes be a little, I don't want to say snooty, but kind of think, well, you know, this is, you know, here's the theological way we should discuss this. Or, or you know, here's the, the proper thing we should say here. When in fact, the church always wants to come down to the level of the people, right? Where they're at and meet people halfway or all the way, right? If you think about the distance God traveled to come down to be a human And then to talk like a farmer so they can understand, right? I can imagine if he came today and he showed up in New York, you know, he talked about finance, right? And and the treasury and interest rates, right? Stochastic processes, right? So this is how he would explain things to people these days, right? Because this is what we understand, right? Imagine Macy's has a sale, right? And he would give analogies like this because this is what we unfortunately understand more than anything else, right? Um... But what I want to talk about the most is he constantly made himself the focus of the kingdom of heaven, of preaching, right? So although it's the kingdom of the Father, he told us that you cannot reach it through him. And he says, he made this very powerful statement. He said, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, he didn't say, I came to show you the truth, the way, and the life. He said, I am the the way, the truth, and the life, right? There's a big difference between someone who says, let me tell you about things you should do. Let me tell you some spiritual principles. Let me explain you some doctrines versus saying, I am the way. What's the significance of this? 
We'll get to it. If you have known me, you have known my father also. From now on, you know him and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. So now Philip doesn't get it. He says, can you show us the father? And he says, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? Who can, who, he who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? So the point I want to make here is we cannot uh, uh, separate the kingdom of God from Christ. The two are fused together, okay? The two are fused. So when he started talking about the kingdom and saying the kingdom is like, you know, this is kind of parable. It's like seeds. It's like this. It's like that. And now he starts switching and he says, I am the way and the truth. So it's now he's saying it's not just a, a, a kingdom, it's like, I am the kingdom, right? So now we're going to put these together here in a second. Um, so, um, so he says, I am the kingdom. And now let's think about how he tried to manifest this kingdom, okay? What were the Jews expecting? They were expecting someone like David. What was David? David was a great king. He slayed Goliath. He's a stud, right? He killed, you know, the biggest enemy of the, of the Jews. He was a king. He was great. He was awesome. Imagine how much better the Messiah should be. Imagine for a moment you are going and you want to represent, um, you know, you're, you're the king of, I don't know, France, all right? And you're coming to conquer. You're, you're Portuguese and you're coming to conquer Brazil. How would you come and represent uh, Portugal? You would, you would send your finest general, your finest army. You'd have them all decked out in purple or whatever, and you'd show up holding a big flag, and you'd say, this is Portugal, right? And everyone would go, wow, it's amazing, right? So whenever someone goes, th- there's always an impress factor that we, we have to put on. Countries will do this. So imagine for a moment when God comes to show his kingdom, the Jews had hundreds and thousands of years to build this up in their minds. Imagine how he must have come. He must have come awesome, right? Out of the sky, full of power, full of strength, okay? Instead, he showed up as what? A baby. Now that choice is a very interesting choice. And as Abuna Kurla said last week, the whole month of Kek is a month of wonder. Right? Because think of that choice to show up as a baby. The most innocent, cute thing on earth. Right? The, the, the thing that is the most helpless. Right? And the most, I mean, you know, Janet will tell you, people want to walk up and just touch your baby. Right? And, and they do. They have dirty hands. Like, did they not learn hygiene? But they, they all go up and they touch the baby. And then they kiss the baby. They have no right to touch or kiss your baby, but they do anyway, right? Why is that? It's a baby. It's everybody's baby. Any, anyone holding a baby, that baby gets to be touched and kissed. It's end of, end of story. It's accessible to all of us. We all have a right to touch and kiss any baby. Am I right? Right, Janet? Including Janet's and yours too, right? So um, this, is, this, is, this is the form Christ took. The baby, right? The most accessible, touchable, cute, huggable thing ever, right? The one that all of us feel like we are allowed to just, right? And Christ, when he came to manifest his kingdom, he said, this is the form I'm going to take. So then you have to ask, well, what kind of kingdom is this, right? The guy didn't show up with a general, no horses, no, no soldiers, no spears, no nothing. He's not freeing us from the Roman Empire. He's not fighting back. He's not doing anything. He shows up like a baby. What is that saying about this God? And it is a month of wonder, right? It's a season of wonder. I mean, you know, sometimes when you tell the kids the Christmas story, they say, yeah, I already heard this one. I already know that story. Do you really know this story? Can we know this story? Can you think about this story too long? Can you stare at that icon too long? I mean, it's an amazing, I mean, it's bewilderment. It's years, right? It's going to be your whole life, and you're not going to get this story, right? So it is a story that never grows old because it's just an amazing thing to ponder. So 
God came um, to tell us something, right? This kingdom is a kingdom of love. It's a kingdom of simplicity. It's a kingdom of humility. He even said that, right? He said, unless you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless what? You become like a little child, right? So in case you didn't get it when I was born, let me refresh your memory. Unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter. So it is the kingdom of simplicity and beauty and humility. All right, so now let's put together the, the verse from the Gospel of Luke. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothing, lying in a manger. Look at the two verses. They're just stuck together and they have nothing to do with each other. First verse. This will be a sign to you. Oh, I'm sorry. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Okay. So that's one verse. Next verse. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothing, lying in a manger. Not in a nice hotel, not in a hospital, but with a bunch of animals. As humble as a human can come. Right? Put the two together. It's paradoxical. Okay, so, um, so now let's put all this together with us. The Lord Jesus taught us the kingdom has drawn near to you, right? He said the kingdom has drawn near to you. Like a baby, we can hold and we can embrace and we can love. Um, and, then, and then he said another verse about the kingdom of heaven that now we have to, now it's going to put it all together for us. So he said, I am the kingdom. And then he said, the kingdom is where? Who can help me? Inside you. Okay? So now, he says, first of all, I am the way and the truth and the life, so I am the kingdom. And then he said, where's the kingdom? It's inside you. So now we, we put all this together and, and we say that not only... Is, so Christ didn't come to teach like a, like a Buddha, you know, parables or, or, you know, Confucius who taught wisdom or, or gave ideals on how to live. No, no, no. He didn't say, let me tell you about the way. Let me point to you the way. Let me tell you about how to live. He said, I am the way to live. And then he said, that kingdom is inside you. Right? So Christ has to come and has to be inside us, a part of us and living in us. And that's why he took the baby form. Because he merged divinity and humanity, like we say in the liturgy. Okay. Now, why is this important? Because, for example, I'll tell you, like last week, what was the, the gospel reading last week? Can I remember? It was a long time ago. But it was one of those weird weeks. It was the 29th of Hatur, I think. Um, and the 29th of any month, does anyone remember what we celebrate? We celebrate the Nativity, which is the 29th of Kiak. We celebrate the Resurrection, and we celebrate the Annunciation. Okay. Now, why does the church do that? Why does the church do that? It's a very important point, is that every 29th of every single month, all year round, we celebrate Christmas, Easter, and Annunciation, because they happen to be on the 29th of the month. So it could be February, it could be March, it could be April, it could be May, but if you have a liturgy on the 29th of the month, you're celebrating Christmas all year round. So when's Christmas in the Coptic church? It's all year round. When's Easter? It's all year round. Right? So the point is, Christ isn't, God isn't in time. We are. Right? So the nativity of Christ, the birth of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ isn't an event that happened. That's an, to me, it's an event that happened because I'm in time. But for God, it is an event that is happening right? His crucifixion is something that is happening. His, his birth, his baptism is something that is happening. His fast is something that is happening, right? So when I fast, I don't fast to remember Jesus' fast that he did 2,000 years ago and, pretend, and imitate him. No, he's still fasting, and I'm joining in his fast. So I'm taking my weak fast 
and I'm putting it together with his strong fast, and together we're going to fast together. Right? So when, 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 when Christ came into time, right, the, 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 the birth of Christ, he united everything spiritual with humanity. Okay? So my flesh and his flesh became one. When we take communion, it isn't a symbolic thing. It is putting the kingdom of heaven where? Inside me. The kingdom of heaven is inside us. So this unification that we have with Christ this is our salvation. It's, it's everything. That's why, you know, since we were little, they, everyone's told us how important communion is, right? It's because it's how we become a church, how we become the body of Christ, right? And if you think about communion for a second, you know, when Abuna prays on the Urbana, you know, we say, how many bodies of Christ are there? Just one, right? And then Abuna takes this Urbana, he breaks it into a hundred little pieces. How many bodies of Christ do we have? Just one, right? Now he takes 100 pieces and he puts it in the mouth of everyone in the church. How many bodies of Christ do we still have? Just one, right? But now we're all in that body, right? We're united to that body. That kingdom of heaven is now inside us, right? So the church brings us into the life of Christ, not as a remembrance, not as a, you know, this is a great guide. He gave some great principles, and you really should try some of this love one another stuff. It's, it works great, that's not what it's all about. It's becoming a part of him and living in him and participating in everything with him. Uh, Father, Metal Miskin, uh, Father Matthew the Poor, he's a, a monk in the St. Macarius Monastery. He died a few years ago. He said, um, no single parable could describe the kingdom of God. Even all the parables together were insufficient. Otherwise, Christ would not have needed to spend 40 days in the fullness of his resurrection and transfiguration explaining again the things of the kingdom of God. Now remember, after Christ resurrected from the dead, it said he appeared to his disciples for 40 days, and it said, what was he doing? Teaching them things concerning the kingdom of God. Now, it, in the Bible, we have three and a half years of him explaining the kingdom of God, giving them parables, telling them stories, right? And Father Metta says, if that was sufficient, he would have stopped there. But he came back and he said, now let me give you another dose. Now that you've seen me resurrected, now that you're starting to get this a little bit more, right? Because you can imagine a man who we just saw crucified, buried for three days. His flesh should have been rotting by now. All of a sudden, he's now teaching us. Now you're starting to see what I'm talking about a little bit more. Now let me further teach you about the kingdom of God. When all our words and all our meanings come to an end, the fact of the kingdom remains unchanged. It is a life that cannot be described but needs to be lived. This is why, however much we talk about the kingdom, we find that words fail us. The kingdom remains something needed by the soul much more than it is needed by the mind uh, or the imagination. So what Father Metta is saying here is the birth of Christ the life of God, the kingdom of heaven being inside of us, it's much more than a story. It's much more than a parable. It's much more than some uh, way of life. It is a life that has to be lived and participated in fully. The last thing I'll say about the icon is, what did the angels say when they saw God? Glory be to God in the highest. Continue. Peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Right? It's on every Christmas card. Right? And this is what the angels said when they saw God. And let's think about those three pieces, and then we can, uh, we can wrap it up. Glory be to God in the highest. So the first thing the angels are doing is praising God. And why are they praising God? <clears throat> because they're amazed at what they're seeing. Right? The first thing is they're seeing God come down and become a human, which should just blow your mind. Right? Every once in a while, you'll see um, a parent, or even better than a parent, a stranger, a teacher, go up to a little kid, and the little kid's scared and crying, and something's wrong with the little kid. And the wise teacher does what? bends down and talks to the little kid 
at his level, right? This is how we talk to little kids. We don't, it doesn't work. So the first thing every parent knows and every teacher knows and anyone who deals with kids is, first thing I do is I go down to one knee, I look him in the eye and I talk in a low voice. I come right down to his level, right? Even if his level is divinity to humanity, that's the first thing Christ did. So the angels are watching this and they're sort of blown away by this. So they're saying, glory be to God in the highest. They are starting to understand the depth of the love that God has for humans and the creation. And then the next thing they say is peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Now what's that all about? What was there before? There was no peace before. Right? What was there before? There is an enmity, a separation between God and man. And when did that separation start? Adam and Eve. Right? So from the moment Adam and Eve happened, right? from the moment uh, Adam and Eve ate from the fruit, sinned, they lost that image and likeness of God. That sin separated them from God. Okay? And they created a rift between them and God that was really unreconcilable. And the Lord looked down and thought, the only way I can save humanity is I have to come down and I have to be like them and I have to teach them the ways from the beginning. And so when they said peace on earth, the angels were starting to figure out what's happening. This was the beginning of the story of salvation, right? So there was no peace between God and man before that. There was an enmity between God and man. And after the birth, God and man there was peace between them. And where did the peace come from? From the fact that God and man became one. Right? So, you know, um, you know if, the, if the Israelis and Palestinians ever want to have peace, right, you have to have a mediator. Okay? What's a mediator? Someone who represents both sides. Really? Someone who mediates. Someone who represents both sides. So if I'm a mediator, right, and uh, an Israeli guy shows up and says, hey, I'm the mediator, what are the Palestinians going to say? We don't want that guy, right? He's going he's to take the Israeli side, right, and vice versa. So the mediator has to come in and he has to say, well, my dad's a Jewish and my mom's Palestinian and I've lived in China my whole life. So I really, you know, I have no interest here, but I can represent both sides and see them equally, right? And we call Christ the mediator between God and man. Right? He's that middle link. He's the one who represents both, and he came and he put both into the incarnation. And this is why the incarnation is so amazing. And this is why the angels said what they did. Peace on earth and goodwill towards men. So this is going to end the centuries, the millennium of, of a rift between God and man. Okay, I'll stop now. I think Sunday school's ending. Does anybody have any questions um, on anything? theology of the church on this matter or anything like that. Nothing. Okay. Glory be to God forever. Stand up and pray. Make us all ready to say with all thanksgiving, our Father who art in heaven.